Uh, as Tom said, we're going to talk about turf tonight. I have about 25 minutes, and we're going to talk about a variety of topics. I might go through some of it kind of quick, but ask your questions. I can stay as long as you want, as long as Tom's going to get me, all right? <laughs> oh, anyway, let's let's begin, all right? Um, I want to talk about voles, first of all. Yeah, it is, as Tom said, this is the first day of spring, and typically we're going to start, we should see uh, the beginning of a snow melt about now but looking across the state i think most of it's gone some of you might have some in your yard north side whatever but as the snow melts back you might notice tracks in your yard where did that come from are those ice cracks no typically not it's typically there it's vole activity vole v-o-l-e not moles but voles these are small mice mouse like creatures okay that are active 12 months out of the year Okay, they're even active under the deep snow cover. In fact, they like it down there because it's warmer than the air we're exposed to. They have a herbaceous diet, so they're gonna eat any plant tissue that they come across. Those little tracks you see in your yard or crack-like features are the trails. And they're, they're creatures of habit. They go up and down those trails in search of food and they dig little burrows. If they're frightened for whatever reason, they head down those burrows. When they're out and about, they're eating. If they run out of food, they are gonna work on your turf. And if they're really hungry, they're going to destroy your turf over the winter months, and you're not going to see it until the snow melts back. Um, but first of all, those, those shallow runways um, are evidence of vole activity. Okay, a little side-by-side little -side comparison of a vole and a mole. Okay, a vole on your left, screen left, is again a mouse-like creature, but they, they have a shorter, stubbier tail. They, actually, they can actually be bigger than a mouse. In fact, they're called meadow mice, but they have a, a, a shorter tail. That should be a clue right there. This is a vole, all right? Now, a mole, on the other hand, is much larger, well, like about the size of a hot dog bun, and it doesn't create surface trails. It, cre or it creates subsurface tunnels that are very destructive to your lawn. They are also active year-round, except they're not gonna do much destruction to your turf while the ground is frozen. They're much deeper down, eating whatever insects they come across, grubs, earthworms, whatever. But back to voles. Okay, again, surface trails active all year round. They feed on vegetation. So how do we control voles? Well, as I said, they have a herbaceous diet. They're going to go after tree bark and turf. Okay, and they're also going to attack your garden during the growing season. What you want to do is keep the cover to a minimum or in other words control the weeds try to keep the weeds down in your garden and if you have brush around your garden try to cut it back too try to maintain about a 15 foot barrier around your garden okay they are uh, again they like cover they prefer cover they're afraid of predatory animals like hawks snakes uh, house cats and so on they don't like to venture out in short grass so keep that barrier around your garden not much you can do about snow cover in the in the winter time. They love it down there, and they're very active. Okay, but um, but in the summertime there are a few things you can do. As I said, they'll go after tree bark if they're hungry enough. So use a plastic tree guard, or you can use a quarter inch mesh fencing. Look at the lower left hand side of your screen for an example. It's a quarter inch mesh right there. The important thing is get this down about one to three inches below ground because they do they they can tunnel somewhat. Again, they like to scurry around on the surface, but they will tunnel slightly if they have to. So um, again, a few uh, tips on bowl control. You can use baits. Um, the old anticoagulants are still out there. Decon makes one, anticoagulant. They, they take that bait in and they're actually gonna bleed to death over a two to five day period. Okay, now the drawback there is that if your pets get a hold of it, a bowl, a dead bowl that is taken on one of these anticoagulant baits, your, your pet's going to suffer the same uh, symptoms. But keep in mind they have two to five days before they actually die. So get them to the vet. The vet will give them a shot of uh, vitamin K. They're, they're going to be restored to health again. Okay, they have newer baits out now. Um, Tomcats one, uh, Taliprid is another one. Um, they have a, an active ingredient called uh, bromethrin. Bromethrin. Okay, it is not an anticoagulant. In fact, those are being phased out. But the drawback here is that if your pet gets a hold of this this new generation bait, the the uh, there is no antidote. So they're somewhat safer than the anticoagulants, but there's no antidote if they get a hold of it. So 
uh, again, I don't know what to tell you to do there. Uh, as far as baits go, well, you, you're probably better off calling in a professional rather than doing it yourself. You can buy some of these over the counter at nurseries, but you're better off getting a professional to bait your yard. Okay. Um, I think we've covered everything about vole activity. Like I said, I'm going to move through these topics kind of fast. Just write down your questions and ask away once we're finished. Let's move on to turf diseases. The snow melts back. Is there any chance of seeing disease activity? Well, yes, there is. Snow mold. In fact, pink snow mold, gray snow mold are very common up here in North Dakota. I'm not going to go into that particular disease or those diseases in depth. Um, I'm going to talk about cultural practices for the most part. And again, if you have questions, just ask them. Diseases are caused primarily by fungi, bacteria, and viruses. Now, I'll notice I have nematodes up there. A nematode is not a disease. It's, 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 it's an animal. It's, it's a microscopic worm with a piercing sucking mouth part called a stylet. The reason I have it up there is because they are very effective vectors of diseases and they do attack turf grass. Okay, as do the other uh, disease organisms I just mentioned. So uh, these are the causal agents of diseases. And like I said, as soon as the snow melts back, you might see evidence of snow mold. So we can experience or see signs of disease activity even in, in late winter or early spring. Okay, what causes disease activity? Well, for the most part, improper cultural practices on turf grass. And the number one improper cultural practice is overwatering. Homeowners do this more than, well, this is again the number one cause of disease infestation overwatering. This is just what the disease organisms like an extended wet leaf. Okay, watering too much and watering at the wrong time. Watering it after supper is the worst thing you can do. You want to get your watering done in the morning. Okay, the uh, again, you water in the morning, uh, the soil is saturated, the leaf dries out by 10 o'clock. Okay, the problem with watering in the evening is that well, Mother Nature is going to give us dew, you're going to give us wet leaf tissue from about 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. That's 12 hours of leaf wetness that we can't do anything about. Now let's say you go out there after supper and water at 6 o'clock. Well you just added three hours of leaf wetness. Now the diseases have 15 hours to work with. Okay so evening, the, wrong, the worst time to water your lawn. Try to get your watering done in the morning. Uh, the problem with watering in the afternoon is that you're going to lose most of it to evaporation. So try to get the watering done in the morning, especially if you have an automated system. Make sure everything, everybody's gone through the shower, uh, you're all off to work, the uh, irrigation system comes on. That's the best way to go about it. Okay, using the wrong turf species, the turf cultivar. Uh, for example, you use Kentucky bluegrass in shade, the plant Kentucky bluegrass in shade. Well, that turf is weakened. Okay, it's susceptible to disease infection at that point because it's in a weakened state. Improper mowing, mowing too high or too low. As far as nutrition, over fertilizing or under fertilizing. For example, you over fertilize brown patch is a possibility. You under fertilize dollar spots a possibility. So try to apply the proper amount of fertilizer. And we're going to talk about fertilizers here uh, in a few minutes. Soil physical properties, compacted soil, low oxygen availability can lead to a weakened turf. Again, making it susceptible to disease infection. Thatch. Thatch is a big problem, especially when it's over a half an inch. Thatch is an accumulation of dead in organic, dead in living organic matter below the turf canopy but above the soil surface. Half inch is beneficial because it provides cushion to the turf. It conserves water. Okay, cools the roots, but anything over half an inch is detrimental. It provides shelter for insects. Okay, it's where disease spores rest until they're ready to become active. And so on. So try to manage your thatch to a level of half inch or lower. And fungicides. I listed fungicides because some can be very harsh. PCNB is an example of a fungicide that has a nine month residual. Believe it or not, you put it down at full rate, it's active for nine months. And it also kills beneficial uh, soil microbes. So let's say uh, PCNB is very effective in controlling uh, snow mold. But if you use it, every year without without um without rotating fungicides well your beneficial microbes are uh, are, are killed off next year your snow mold problems can be worse so improper cultural practices now you add to that the heat of summer it throws your turf in decline and this is when they're very susceptible to disease activity or disease outbreaks 
Okay, now let's say you see a disease and you can't figure out what it is. Okay, there's no shame to it. Disease diagnosis is very, very difficult. Well, what you want to do is take a sample and send it on to the diagnostic lab here at NDSU or a private company. But you want to take the right type of a sample. The best way to go is in the middle of the, the infected area and cut a pie-shaped wedge out so that you get the, the, the damaged area, you get the healthy damaged interface area, and you get a little bit of the healthy turf. Okay, and we recommend that you take about three inches of, of a root sample just in case it's a soil-borne disease. Okay, the reason you don't want to take a full sample from the dead area is because that turf is gone. There's, there's very, very little disease activity going on there. You want that interface, the dead and healthy tissue, because that's where most of the organisms are at. And we ask that you take a little bit of the healthy tissue just in case they're advancing back, attacking that healthy tissue. But remember, try to get about three inches of root sample too. Okay, put it in a plastic bag. You do not have to seal it all the way because it could turn to mush by the time it gets to the diagnostic lab. Try to mail it early in the week rather than late in the week because it might sit in the post office room over the weekend and the sample could deteriorate. Okay. Let's move on to core aerification. I mentioned earlier that improper watering, applying too much water, is the number one cause of turf diseases as far as residential home lawn um, turf care goes. Okay, what you want to do is provide conditions of uh, uh, to promote good drainage. And this can be done through core aerification. Okay, and it does more than that. It provides good drainage, and it also stimulates soil microbes that will break down the thatch layer. Okay, and it also enhances the turf vigor, especially if you can time it with fertilization. Okay, so core aerification, again, to help promote surface drainage, especially if you see puddling in your yard. Okay, this is a picture of a core aerifier. You can pick up one of these machines at any rental outfit, any, any, again, any large size rental outfit. Usually cost about $25 for a two hour period, and that's about what it's gonna take to aerify your yard. They move about as fast as a lawnmower. Okay, you get done with the job, take it back. Okay, now, um, again, this is what you're going to see after you aerify. These are the cores that are pulled out of the ground by the machine. These cores are not going to hurt your grass at all. You can leave them in place. They are not going to hurt the grass at all. Now, if you're managing a golf course, a different story. You have to pick them up. They usually vacuum them up because these cores will affect the game of golf. Okay, they will affect ball roll, I should say. But as far as a residential home line goes, you can leave them in place. They're not going to hurt your turf at all. You're going to break them up the next time you mow. The only problem with leaving them in place, if, if it rains and you have children, they're going to track them inside and mess up your carpet. So, uh, but if you leave them in place, not going to hurt your turf one bit. Okay, and here's a picture of uh, a cutaway picture of how the turf's going to take advantage of those core holes that you uh, provided. You can see how the root tissue grows down into them, especially if you top dress afterwards. Okay, how much should I core aerify as far as uh, affecting the, the surface? How much, should, how much of the surface area should be cultivated? Let me use that word. Well, if you're working with a very compacted area, like a, a football field or a playground at a grade school, you want to cultivate about 15 to 20 percent of the surface area per year. Now, if it's really compacted, you might core aerify in the spring and the fall. Well, affect about 7 to 10 percent of the ground every time you core aerify. So by the end of the year, you've actually cultivated 15 to 20 percent of that severely compacted turf. As far as a, a residential home lawn, 3 to 3.5 percent is good enough. Now, how many, how many times do I need to go over to get that 3 to 3.5 percent? Well, that depends on core diameter and core spacing. We'll talk about that in the next slide. But um, if you want to read more about uh, what it's going to take to achieve that three and a half percentage. Uh, the UMass extension has a good publication, and hopefully with your notes you can pick up that website. They have a good publication as far as core diameter, core spacing, or tying diameter, tying spacing, and how many passes you should make. Okay, so pick up that uh, uh, pamphlet or that bulletin if you can. It's available online. Okay, a little bit of uh, information about tying sizes. Quarter inch, three eighths of an inch, up to three quarters of an inch. These are hollow tine. They're going to spit out a core. But you can also get a what we call a solid tine aerifier. It's a solid tine, just as I, I, I mentioned. It's not going to spit out a core. It's just going to punch a hole in the ground. 
The problem with using a solid tie and airifier over and over again is subsurface compaction. At the bottom of that tine, or the bottom of that tine depth, I should say, you're going to start to develop a pan layer that's going to be impermeable to water. So using a solid tine airifier is not a problem, but remember, don't use it continuously. Okay, try to go to a, to a solid tine that's going to spit out a core. Okay, again, the huge advantage of a solid tine is that there's no mess to pick up afterwards. Okay. Um, let, me, let me back up. Let me back up. One more thing. As far as airifying goes, you can do it in the spring or fall. The problem with doing it in the spring is that you're cultivating the turf, you're pulling up weed seeds, and you're, you're creating a nice seed bed for weed seeds. Okay, so weed encroachment can be a problem if you airify in the spring. Fall is the best time if you're going to choose between spring or fall, either or. But if it's severely compacted ground, you're probably going to want to airify in the spring and the fall. Now, when you airify in the fall, make sure you have at least one month of growing weather left because you will damage the turf when you airify to some extent. You're not going to kill it, but you're going to damage it. Give it at least one month to recover before winter sets in. Okay? Let's move on to our next topic. It's nice if you can fertilize after your spring airification. Okay, if you can time it. And we'll talk about fertilizer timing here in a bit. But when you pick up a package of fertilizer, you'll notice three numbers on the front. This is called the analysis. These are the three numbers, sometimes a fourth number. We'll talk about that. But this is called the analysis. Those three numbers stand for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in that order. And what those numbers indicate is percent bag weight of those actual nutrients. In this case, 27% nitrogen would be found in that bag, 3% phosphorus, and 3% potash. Okay, I should say phosphate, not straight phosphorus, and uh, again, not straight potassium, but, um, but in this case, potash. Okay, there's an oxygen molecule attached to it. We're not going to go into that tonight. But these numbers indicate percent bag weight. And you might find a fourth number. This, this stands for a minor. It could be sulfur. It could be iron copper, whatever, zinc, but these are miners. The plants need them to survive, but not in numbers as great as the uh, macronutrients. But typically, you'll see the three numbers, okay, and maybe a fourth. Okay, how, when do we fertilize here in the upper Midwest in North Dakota? Well, these are your three target dates, the three big summer holidays, Memorial Day, Fourth of July, and Labor Day. We recommend that you put down a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet Okay, on Memorial Day, 4th of July, and Labor Day. Now, these three target dates do not stand true across the nation. They work well for us in the upper Midwest. I'm from Kansas. Our target dates down there are late April, early May, then again in September, and then again in November. Those target dates don't work for us up here in North Dakota. Remember the big three summer holidays. If you can fertilize on those days or a week before or a week after, you're in good shape. Now, if it's really hot on the 4th of July, what I mean by that is anything over 75 degrees, you want to hold off. You could injure your turf if you fertilize when it's really hot out. But our summers are usually mild enough that we can get by with a 4th of July nitrogen application without causing any damage. Okay, um, some information. Uh, I, I mentioned that homeowners typically fertilize three times a year. Okay, and you can see that. Most homeowners try to manage a medium type quality lawn two to three applications per year, and I'll explain that due to you in a bit. Golf course managers might actually put down four, five, or six pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year because their turf is typically always under stress from foot and vehicular traffic and because of low mowing height that they try to maintain. Okay, again, homeowners, two to three pounds a year. Low quality, about one pound of nitrogen per year. Now, let's go back to the medium quality again. Why would I say two? Well, if you, collect your if you do not collect your clippings, you return them to the soil, that equates to one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. So if you do not collect your clippings, you can actually skip one of the applications. That's what I'm getting at there. Okay, so again, what determines whether you're going to put down a typical three pounds a year or maybe six pounds a year? As I said, if the turf's under stress, you're going to put down more. And that depends on soil texture. Okay, do you have a compacted soil? Is it always under stress because of low oxygen? Do you get a lot of rainfall on sandy soil? Well, that might require more than three pounds of nitrogen per year. Clipping management, if you don't collect the clippings, you can get by with less than three pounds per year. Intense use, like on a golf course, is it always under stress? Well, you might have to apply more than three pounds per year. 
Okay, so try to use these as a guideline. But typically, homeowners are going to put down about three pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. Unless, again, you return your clippings, you get by with two. Okay. Um, fall fertilization. When do you fertilize in the fall? Well, you're better off applying on Labor Day. Now, sometimes people in this far north will apply their fertilizer late in fall, late September, early October. You can get by with that, and it's okay. When you apply a fertilizer at that time, most of the energy, the nutrients, are going to go to root development rather than canopy development. But the risk you run is snow mold infection. You, you want that turf to go dormant. You don't want to encourage growth late into the season. That's just what the snow mold disease organisms want, okay? So try to get that last application down around uh, Labor Day, okay? Again, you're taking your chances if you apply later than that, but it happens a lot, okay? Um, maybe timing doesn't allow for it, okay? But you, you'll get by. You'll be okay, but you do run the risk of a snow mold infection, okay? Once a year, if you're going to fertilize, once a year, your most important application is in late September. You help the turf get through or recover from a hot summer, and you prepare it for a long winter. And it also allows for stored energy so they can green up the following spring. If you're going to fertilize twice a year, you can skip the first application. Hit the July and September um, uh, application. Three times a year, there again, Memorial Day, Fourth of July, and Labor Day. Okay, we recommend that you apply it half a pound per thousand square feet in two different directions to avoid skips, okay? By the time you get done going in both directions, north to south and east to west, you will have that full pound. Okay, look at that. Somebody used a drop spreader, maybe thinking it was a broadcast spreader, and they didn't get the job done. So, but you can see the effects of fertilizer. Okay, it, it does do its job. It's very important. Nitrogen is a very important macronutrient. Here's another example of improper application. Again, somebody used a drop spreader, probably thinking that it was a broadcast spreader. Okay, fertilizer calculation. How can you determine how much you're putting out? Okay, we're going to move kind of quick here. Um, a quick calculation for you. You want to put down one pound per thousand, solve for X. Equal, and you're applying to a 12,000 square foot lawn. X over 12,000. One times 12,000 divided by 1,000. That means you need 12 pounds of nitrogen. You're using a product that has a 29.35 analysis. Divide the 12 by 29. You will need 41 pounds of actual 29.35 to get the job done. Okay, I have to start moving kind of quick here. Let's talk about weeds right now. Well, what is a weed? It's a plant that interferes with your objectives, okay, or it's simply a plant out of place. Well, who coined the term weed? Well, an agronomist named Jethro Tull. He was a 17th, 18th century agronomist. He's a very brilliant individual, invented the seed drill, invented the first metal plow that eventually uh, developed into the moldboard plow. Okay, he coined the term weed. Now, if you're my age, you remember a group called Jethro Tull back in the 70s. It's not the same guy. Okay, a lot longer, a lot, 200 years before that. Okay, weeds are not the cause of a poor lawn. They are the result. Okay, no competition. Weed encroachment, you lose your lawn. Okay, your best defense against weeds is a nice, healthy, vigorous lawn. Proper cultural practices. Okay, let's talk about some, let's say, again, you don't have the best lawn, some weeds broke through, what are your options? Or weeds typically do break through. Well, you can put down a pre-emergent. The name pre-emergent is misleading. It doesn't kill the weed seed. It actually kills the weed as it's germinating. So the word pre-emergent is misleading. But if applied properly, it kills the weed seed as it's germinating. Okay, when the radical emerges, it touches the treated soil, absorbs the poison, and the weed seed dies. But it actually has to germinate first. Pre-emergents are ineffective if you apply them after germination occurred or if you uh, disturb the soil after application. For example, you core aerify after you applied your pre-emergents. Okay. Uh, Pre-emergent herbicides, uh, no need to use them in shady turf, okay, because weeds aren't going to have much of a chance to get established. You want to time it as far as crabgrass germination uh, goes. Here in North Dakota, that's usually mid-May, so you want to get the pre-emergent out in about early May, okay, and crabgrass usually is the first warm season weed that germinates. Well, not weed is actually the first one, but crabgrass is one of the first ones and the most prevalent weed. 
Okay, try to apply two to three to weeks, two to three weeks earlier than than um than germination. So typically germination occurs early May, so you want to get out maybe mid-April. Okay, now the problem is our, our weather varies from year to year, but using the calendar method, it works eight out of every 10 years or 80% of the time. You can use indicator plants. We don't have any solid research to indicate which is the best indicator plant, but a lot of people go off of forsythia bloom. Okay, another option is to monitor soil temperature. What you want to do is get a digital thermometer and monitor soil temperature. When the soil temperature reaches 55 degrees at a four inch depth, usually warm season weeds or seeds start to germinate. So when you, when you notice that the, seed temp, the soil temperature is around 50 degrees, you want to get out there and, uh, or apply your pre-emergent so that it's in place when germination occurs. Okay, common pre-emergent herbicides, pre-em, team, Dimension, which is the best, another good one, pendimethalin, barricade, 2%. I want to mention 2%. It's a weak pre-emergent, but it's the only one that can be used at the time of uh, turf seeding. Here's one that will not kill turf seeds. Okay, but the drawback is it has to be applied every four to six weeks. Okay, the other ones can offer season-long coverage, most of the other ones. Okay, barricade dimension require, all but barricade and dimension require season-long um, uh, let me state that again. All but barricade require repeat applications. Okay, I'm told to speed it up here a little bit. Uh, again, barricade dimension will uh, provide season long coverage if applied at full rate. Okay, dimension is the best pre emergent herbicide because it will actually kill weeds up to the three leaf stage. So if you don't get it out in time, you're still in luck if you're working with dimension. Okay. Um, now, let's say uh, you didn't get the pre-emergent out on time. You have grassy weed problem. You can use a couple products. One is Acclaim. We'll kill crabgrass and other summer annuals without hurting your, uh, your, uh, your turf. Acclaim. Okay. It can cause problems to Kentucky bluegrass and creeping bent grass, so use it with caution. Highly injurious to bent Bermuda grass, but we don't grow Bermuda grass up here, so not an issue. Another product is called Drive. Okay. Post-emergent weed herbicides, grass weed herbicides. Let's move on from there. Non-selective, Roundup. I won't say too much about it because I'm about out of time. Another non-selective is called Finale, another good product, but it doesn't do too well on warm season grasses. But we can grow buffalo grass and blue grama up here. Okay, post-emergent broadleaf, the Phenoxys, been used since World War II, 2,4-D and MCCP. Okay, these are synthetic oxins. They grow the plant to death. Dicamba is a is a let's see a benzoic acid. That's an oxin inhibitor. All three together work very good. It gives you broad spectrum control of weeds. This product is called Trimet Classic. Okay, again, a broad spectrum weed control, broadleaf weed control. The thing is, dicamba is mobile in the soil and it can be absorbed by uh, ornamental tree roots and so on. So be careful. Don't get too close to the, your trees if you're using dicamba. Okay, let's move on from there. And then we have our new generation broadleaf phenoxys. Speed Zone is an excellent product. It's essentially Trimet Classic with another chemical called Carfentrazone, where it breaks through the cuticle, allowing the, the product, the pesticide, to enter the, uh, the weed for an effective kill. Okay, Power Zone is another one. MC, oh, I'm sorry, MCPA rather than 2,4-D because some communities will not allow 2,4-D. Uh, California, Montreal, in that case, you can use Power Zone up that way. Q4, broadleaf weed control with crabgrass killer blended in. Okay, so there it is. A quick rundown. I'm through. We're ready for questions. I think, oh, I kind of went over. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, Alan, we've got some good questions here from the people, and we're happy to take some more questions from others. You mentioned about proper mowing height. Right. What, what height do you recommend? Well, it varies with the turf grass. Kentucky bluegrass, two to three inches. Two and a half to three inches is ideal. Fescue, three to four inches is ideal. So it varies. It depends on the turf grass you're using uh, okay. that you have in your yard. Okay. How about, let's say they were unfortunately a victim of vol damage Okay. Got those runways in the turf. Okay. What are we going to do about it? As far as the runways go, they're going to heal over. 
All right, if you have a creeping type of a grass, like Kentucky bluegrass is rhizomaceous, uh, creeping red fescue is going to fill in too. If it's a bunch grass, like ryegrass or fescue, tall fescue, you're out of luck, okay? Uh, but typically moles, well, let me backtrack. They are active under the snow. They don't care what kind of grass you have, and they don't care if it's growing tall or not. The snow provides cover for them. So, but a creeping grass will cover those trails, okay, okay. Once, once it warms up. How about uh, this person has some dark green patches in their lawn, but it's not the neighbor's dog. Okay. Are they circular? Dark green patches. I'm thinking fairy ring. Okay. Okay. Fairy ring is quite common. Usually we see it in a big arc. It could be 30, 40 feet across. It's a circular ring. Circular rings, and they can be small the size of a hubcap. I've seen them that, that small before. Um, gosh, without a, a proper diagnosis, I can't say but that's a possibility. You know, so that's a good, you know, that's a good. Uh, introduction that if anybody has an unusual situation like that we've got digital cameras it's a great right. tool and we got access to Alan right, you or your local me. county extension agent you know, take a picture and send it to extension and then we can identify that situation for you or or lead you to the next step sure so, sure yeah, send me a picture I'll yeah, be glad to help you out tool. how about uh, moles how do we kill a mole in the lawn well moles okay Baits uh, applied effectively will do the job, and they're tough. They're just tough. You can get these over-the-counter baits. Uh, Tomcat is one of them. Another one is called uh, Talpirid. Okay, these are the new generation ones. They're, they're not an, an anticoagulant. Okay, the uh, active ingredient is uh, bromethylene. Again, not an anticoagulant, but the drawback with bromethylene is, is there is no antidote. If your pet gets a hold of it, they're done. Okay. How about a harpoon trap? Harpoon traps are effective, but very effective. They are effective. Now look for movement. You can see that animal moving under the trail. They're scurrying around. They're feeding. Try to put the harpoon trap a few feet ahead, but they are very sensitive to movement. So once they feel that vibration of that harpoon trap going in, they're going to back off. But be patient. Eventually, they're going to go into it. Hopefully, they go into it. Now there's a misconception that moles are blind and they're deaf. Well, they're not. They have very tiny eyes, and they have very small internal ears, but they do operate a lot off of uh, ground vibration. Okay. Okay, we've got to keep the rapid questions going here. How do you control quack grass? You can't. The only option you have is Roundup. Okay, there is no product that will kill quack grass without harming your, your, your gyrable turf. Now, there was a product called Certainty. Certainty lost its cool season label, so we can't use it. And it was very effective in suppressing quack grass. In fact, sometimes it killed it outright. But we can't use that product on cool season grass anymore. Now, the good news is we're talking about spring lawn care, and quack grass will green up before your lawn does. So it's an, a good way to identify the grass and do a okay. target spray. And as far as target spray is good. Emphasize right, target. Right, right. <laughs> I would get a string line and box out the contaminated area. And uh, and go out a little further because they do produce rhizomes, okay, and kill off that area and then reseed it. That's all you can do. That's the only chemical option that we can legally yeah. apply to get yeah. rid of quack. That's what about legal stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's right. all being recorded here. <laughs> How about what's the best thing for Canadian thistle? Canadian thistle, um, in turf. Well, I mentioned uh, speed zone. It's essentially TriMet Classic with a chemical called Carfentrazone. It will eat yeah. through that waxy cuticle and do a good job. Fall. Now, uh, and apply it in the fall, right? That's when the yes, the, yes, the yes, fall. That's, that's when it's going to pull the uh, the pesticide all the way down to the deepest roots and kill off all those rhizomes down there and so on. There's a um, oh, well, there's an effective ag product called Milestone. It's not labeled for lawns though, but okay. if you have a field full of thistle, we're not going to yeah. talk about it. Okay, then. okay, we can't use it. No How about you? You just know too much information. I got to oh, stop you. I didn't say that. <laughs> How about uh? After someone does a core aeration, should they top dress their lawn? It would help, but it's not necessary. Those holes will fill in again. Okay, you're going to break up those cores. A lot of that dirt's going to go back down into the holes. You can core aerate. I mean, I'm sorry, you can top dress with soil, but it's not necessary. Just keep that in mind. Okay. So this person has some mysterious two inch diameter bumps all over the lawn. All right. What can be doing this? Andy? Okay, those are worm castings. What can we okay. do about it? Okay, there is no chemical Open that you can legally apply. Cut. So what you have to do, the only thing you can do is go over it with a verticutter. Okay, knock them down, but I'll tell you what, they're going to come wreck. 
Okay, that's just an indication you have a healthy soil. There's a lot of earthworm activity down there. And uh, you, you, another option is to roll the turf if it's moist enough, but they're going to come right back. Okay, you legally cannot apply a pesticide to control them. So I'm not going to say any more about that's that. That's right, Alan. We're going to stay with the legal stuff. All right. Your vertical mower, great <laughs> idea. Or a roller. How about an ant infestation? You got any legal solutions for oh, ants? Oh, sure. There are a lot of, lot of uh, uh, insecticides labeled for ants. Um, seven will do the job. Okay. Other ones, just, again, there are a lot of products out there. How about what looks like white spots in the lawn, like white spray paint? White spray paint, powdery mildew possibly. You know, it affects our lilacs or zinnias and so on. It can be the same thing out there in your lawn. Uh, normally, we don't recommend a chemical control for it because it's going to go away as soon as the warm weather arrives. Uh, a little too early for it right now, but if you see it in spring or fall, it's probably powdery mildew, about the size of a dinner plate or a hubcap. That's typical. Um, I'm assuming that's what it is, but uh, it'll go away once the uh, warm weather returns. How about, you know, when you talk about all these toxic weed control recommendations, right. how about a, do you have any non toxic weed control recommendations? Let's say for a high traffic area or with, you know, lawns with kids and pets? Okay, oh, well, that's a tough one. There's, there's, there's really, well, I mentioned pre emergence. Um, corn gluten meal is an effective pre-emergent if it's applied at 20 pounds per thousand square feet. What is corn gluten meal? It's chicken feed. Basically, it's chicken feed. But it does have some pre-emergent activity if applied at 20 pounds per thousand square feet. Again, it's not going to be as effective as the synthetic chemicals that we use. But if you're looking for the organic approach, there you go. As far as uh, post-emergent organic, oh, I, I just, I'm not aware of anything. I hear people spraying vinegar yeah, out there, but I, I doesn't get to the roots. It's it's right. It's, it's, How about this person is, has a severe vol problem? Sounds like poor Daryl. He's worried about his tomatoes. You're right. Okay. I guess they'll go after everything. They'll go I after oh, 12, 12 months out of the year. Try to keep your garden weed free and try to maintain a buffer around your garden. If I don't know what the grass is like around your garden. If it's tall, mow it down. You have 15 foot barrier. These voles do not like to go out in shallow turf. They're afraid of predatory animals, right. so the I try to. Hawks will get them. Right. Hawks, snakes, cats. There you go. Yeah. And we answered about night crawlers, Julian. It had to do with the vertical mower. How about cactus out in the west? You know, that uh, prickly, prickly pear, pear cactus yeah. issue. Do you have any magic solutions for oh, that? Oh, golly. Uh, they have waxy cuticle. That's how they survive the summer months, especially in the south, in the American southwest. So something that's going to cut through that cuticle. I can't recommend something. That's something I normally don't go after. So I read a label. I might point you in the area of, of uh, speed zone. I don't know if it's labeled for cactus, but it does. Carpentrazone ethyl will cut through that waxy cuticle. I just can't say because that's a normal. That's a weed I'm not too familiar with. Okay, how about uh, we'll just end it with this. What's the best way to treat a pet spot in the springtime? Pet spots. I should have been ready for that one. Um, you know, well, once the damage is done, reseeding. Okay. Now there are some dietary supplements you can feed to the dog to help neutralize the the, uh, the acidic effects of their urine. Okay. Um, you can pick those up at at well from your vet. Okay, and maybe at a nursery too. But dietary supplements and this is a question I got last year, and you know what? I forgot the answer. It's um. If you can get that person to call me back, I'll give them the answer. <laughs> okay, there you but, go. Uh, again, dietary just supplements. Leach it out. Leach it out. It, but if the damage is done, they're going to have to reseed it. Yeah, okay. Uh, cool. they, they actually, actually it's, they, they burned the turf. The actual will heal. Yeah. Okay, I think we covered everything. There was a baby's breath as a weed, but I think the same type of situation. You mentioned all your, uh, you know, Trimex solutions. Right. Baby's breath. breath would be a broadleaf. So, yeah. again. Harvest it and use it for your 401k. Well, there you That's go. Yeah. Have a pleasant smell to there it. There you know. go. Okay, Alan, I want to thank you for getting this off to a strong you start. Let's thank Alan for our first talk in spring fever this yeah. year. And thank, thank you, Alan. You bet. And I'm we're going to take it. a very short five minute break here and learn about soils in our garden and containers. Okay.